on this beautiful Sunday night, we are coming to you live from our Nile Serena studios. This is Perspective with Josephine Karunji. Good evening and a very warm welcome to the show. We are coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room. Now, for nearly a week in the month of February this year, Dilbia Hanga and William Chintu, two reporters from the NTV newsroom, camped in Mavira Forest for, yes, nearly a week. And they wanted to see for themselves and to also show us and share with us uh, findings of the effect human activity is having on the forest. And we have some of the pictures um, that they took when they were in Mavira Forest, and those are showing on your screen right now. Uh, so what they found out was um, there are homesteads of people who have encroached on the forest. Meandering streams which fed off the ecosystem are slowly dying out. The cut trees are being used as a source of softwood, and they also provide charcoal, and you can see a, a man cutting down one of the trees. That's one of the trees that Sudil is hugging in the forest. <laughs> He found it cut. <laughs> and um, the team also found out the trees, like the highly sought after mahogany, are no more in the forest. Now, this means that other species are at risk of extinction. Is brought to you by Sparkle Saloon. Professional, affordable, and quality services. Join me and let me introduce our guests for tonight. I'll start with the, the guest to my very right, Rene Naguti, who is the range manager at Choga Range National Forestry Authority. Thank you for joining us, Rene. Thank you for inviting us. All right, and then we have Leo Twinum Hanji, who is the coordinator planning at the National Forestry Authority. Thank you and good evening. And then finally, we have Annette Kandule, who is from Care International Uganda. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Well, first of all, I would like to send a special thank you to Sudil and Chintu, who spent uh, those many nights. I think sometimes we have to see things to believe uh, what is actually happening, even though you might not agree. If you missed their story, you can visit the NTV Uganda YouTube channel, and you'll be able to watch it there. Well, let's say it as it is. is brought to you by Sparkle Saloon. Professional, affordable, and quality services. Now, watching that story, uh, I'm sure you, wa you watched it. You, did you watch the deal story? And yes. you, you did watch it. And now seeing some of those clips that have been uh, on the screen right now, of people actually cutting down the trees and the charcoal and all of that, what is going through your mind? You remember when the story came out? We, we said, okay, everybody has a role, and we need to work together to address the challenges that face the forests in Uganda. And so uh, we have also gone to the field to verify the boundaries of the gazetted forests. Of course, you will note that, <coughs> for example, the National Forest Authority is in charge of only the gazetted forests. These are government forests which have boundaries, and these contribute about 15% of the whole country. But the big chunk, the 70%, is actually private forests. So another 15% is, is, is in charge of the Uganda Wildlife Authority. By the Uganda yes, Wildlife Sandra, Authority. The authority. Okay. Yeah. For example, in that picture, that big Chilundu tree that you see is actually in the enclaves of Mavira. So who is supposed to be pro uh, protecting that big tree? Like I said, <laughs> the, the local communities, for example, the local leaders of this village participated when this tree was cut. When we went on ground, you realize the community is concerned. The LC1 chairman was involved and the community and those people who illegally cut it were arrested and the power source impounded. But what we are trying to put in perspective is that <coughs> there is increasing consumption of forestry products. Okay, so we're going to get to that conversation. But I, I wanted to know from the rest of you what you thought. Um, yeah. 
I, uh, when I saw that clip, uh, what came into my mind is that uh, human activity is sort of responsible, res is the responsibility, I mean, quite responsible for the depletion of the forest cover. Yes. Yes, I thank you, Karung. First of all, I would like to thank Sudir Biarhanga to bring out that story and um, NTV, the number of others that they brought out, but maybe this was stronger and it brought out other real issues. I, I do agree that what Sudir brought is, is an issue to this country. Uh, he interviewed communities and uh, agency, NFA, uh, together with NFA, we've been working on a governance and accountability uh, program uh, called Forest, Forest Resources Sector Transparency. And we found out similar or related incidences. Um, I think what we need to do is to put in perspective that story. And it has many angles. One is why is the agency uh, failing to do that? Well, let's start from there. Why <laughs> is the agency failing? Because it looks to a lot of people like the agency is failing. Even though you've explained that it's only 15% and UA has another 15 and the 70 is privately owned. So where are the issues? The agency has not failed per se to protect the trees. But of course, the agents cannot be everywhere at all times. So we are constrained sometimes. The activity may take place in an area where we are not. And like my colleague said, it, is a, it was in an enclave. An enclave means this is a land which is outside the forest reserve. Okay. We are uh, actually outside our, our area of mandate. So even if the National Forestry Authority was able to do its job 100% and, and protect its 15% of the forest cover, we still have 70 plus another 15 that's still, yes. You see, all Ugandans must appreciate that it is everyone's role. <coughs> the NFA has challenges. Just because, like I said, the consumption of forestry products continues to increase. <coughs> but there is also the intervention. We have uh, done a lot of work, on the other hand, to provide interventions for forest conservation. That is just in Mavira, the main natural forest. But we are in charge of over 506 forest reserves. The point here is that <coughs> we all need to strengthen our networks and be able to do our roles at different levels. The civil society are there to do a law. When we network within our mandates, we should be able to increasingly see progress in the conservation of these forests and make them relevant to the people. The forest cover statistics that you shared with me, um, yes, yes. in the year, in 1990, we had four million, over four million, well, close to five million hectares of forest. Yes, please. By 2015, we'd gone to 1.9 million. What's happening? Uh, Josephine, I wanted to mention one thing that uh, we, we've done studies and we've been out there uh, working with NFA and the Forest Sector Support Department. Uh, there are a number of factors. The first one is the underfunding of the sector. Uh, I'll give an example that in the, the year 2016, 2017, uh, NFA requested 13 billion, but was only allocated 4 billion. So the, the issue of under budgeting is an issue. Underfunding, but there is also the, the, the human resource. The other aspect is they are competing priorities uh, with the communities uh, generally. And, and um, the communities need by blood. So our, our research, as even Sudhi saw, that um, the governance of the sector cannot be delinked from the broad governance challenges. Uh, within the country, issues around lack of transparency and accountability, 
and uh, I will not expand on that, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, that, that, those are, are issues, and um, also the issue of alternatives in terms of uh, using forest products. I, I want us to look yeah. at alternatives a little later on, but Leo, yeah. you look like you have something to say. But y you see, like we are talking, <coughs> 1990, what was the population of Uganda? Today is 2018, what is the population of the country? <coughs> and uh, we have been comparing the underlying causes. But I want to tell you, the biggest problem is lawlessness. You have seen in every sector of this country, people do not respect the law. Glad you have brought it up. They don't even <laughs> respect themselves. Look at every sector. So it is a duty of everybody to respect the law. They are poor people who are peaceful. They are poor people who respect their heritage, their culture. So as a country, the top leadership must become strict on respect of the law. And we must note that our country is a natural resource-based economy. If we are saying we want people who are rich, prosperous, we must have a stable environment. You when cannot you be peaceful when the environment is not peaceful. When you say lawlessness, it, it could mean anything. Give me an example of how we can relate that to our forests. Look at the current land grabbing, the illegal land titles in forest reserves. And I have indicated some time to people that let us be exemplary, especially those in positions of responsibility. The local people want livelihood. Those you call the big people cause a bigger destruction. So in my view, in those years, in the past, by the way, our grand-grandparents used to respect nature. Today, things have changed. So let us respect the law, respect our heritage, protect nature. You cannot cheat nature. No wonder these climate disasters have come. So let everybody at every level respect the natural resources, and then we will be able to derive the multiple functions and it transforms society. It's unfortunate that you cannot control everybody. So uh, <laughs> what, yes. Yeah, Anthony. what I wanted to interject I is, is that uh, it's the love for the natural resource. The, the people of Uganda should love their natural resource. We shouldn't look at the forests as the enemies. Yes, there are issues of livelihood, we understand. But what extent c c can you go on to endanger the forest at the expense of the other? Because now this resource is managed on behalf and in the trust of the people of Uganda. So we shouldn't really front our personal interests at the expense of the others. We should really love our country and know that it doesn't belong to you as an individual, but it belongs to all of us. Okay. Yes. Well, um, first of all, uh, I think Leo. Um, should thank us, civil society organizations. I always, I always <laughs> been the, uh, Why I'm saying this is that he talked about the issue of land grabbing and uh, the civil society organizations under the Uganda Forest uh, Governance and Learning Group. Um, we, we've been working with the, the Minister of Water and Environment and the Minister of Lands, and you may have seen in November that uh, the Minister of Lands uh, cancelled around 150 land titles. And that was an effort that we, are, we really have, or we did, to actually uh, restore. Uh, and and Leo is, Leo is uh, clapping for you. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> let's continue <laughs> with that conversation yes. right after this break. Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, <laughs> Nile Room. Well, this is the second part of, of the show, and that means our time is running very quickly. So I wanted to know what is stopping us from stopping the degradation of our forests? 
as an authority? Yeah, as an authority, we are trying our best to stop the degradation, the degradation of How? the form. How? We are putting mechanisms in place. We are, in, you know, it's attitudinal change. We are trying to talk to the communities because the people who are damaged, who are destroying the forest are the communities. We are changing the attitude of the community towards the what? Towards the forestry. We also have law enforcement in place. So we have put law enforcement in place to support in monitoring and trying to cap down the illegalities within the forest reserves. Okay. Well, one of the questions that, that, that's been sent to me, um, Ronald is asking, is saying, in many places of work, if someone fails to do their job, they are relieved of their duties. Can the officials tell us why they should still hold the jobs, given the reports that we are seeing? Leo, do you want to take this one? Yeah, you, you can see <coughs> that uh, as an authority, as a government institution, everybody has a role. My brother has a, a lot of tools to play because the environment has no boundaries. I want us to appreciate that despite the challenge, NFA currently has embarked on uh, a big campaign for restoration of the degraded forest reserves. And I'm happy to note that uh, through coordination with the civil society organizations, the members of parliament, actually the parliament as an institution, and all the conservation organizations have strengthened the partnership for restoration of these degraded areas. We have also increasingly <coughs> focused on production of seedlings to supply to the community for planting. As I speak on an annual basis, we are focused on supplying 30 million seedlings. And look at this. As you move from Kisoro to Kampala, from Kampala to Guru, up to the east, you will see roadside nurseries. And now the strategy is that we want to involve the youth and regenerate their production of seedlings so that we increase their income and also try to do heavy, massive planting. You must have seen that uh, even those who have not been involved in forestry, they have now known that forestry is a good retirement investment project. So if we want to die a rich person, plant trees. But what kind of trees are they planting? And I, that's something I've always wondered, that um, when you know, people like to, to plant pine, right? I think it's mostly... Yeah, yeah, you are right. We have zoned this country according to which trees do well where. And so we need to encourage everybody to reach to every region. We have 12 regional centers, and our people need to go to the people and sensitize them and guide them on tree planting. Of course, you know, we have to work with the district forestry services, who also have a mandate on people's forests. So you can't really just plant any tree? You cannot. Pla the point <coughs> I'm making now is that we have given a caution that we have what we call conservation planting. You plant to restore and protect the natural environment, our streams, our lake shores, our river banks. Don't plant exotics on the river banks, on the lake shores, but also they are zoned, there are zones where you can plant eucalyptus and pine for money. So it depends on the objective of planting. And that's where, as an institution and as government, <coughs> we have not done enough to reach to the people and try to guide them. What, Some happens, of them, what happens if I plant a different tree where it shouldn't be? What, what happens? Of course, we have what we call species site matching. Certain species must be planted in a particular area. So if the tree is meant for conservation, it should, it, should be, it should play the role and the values of conservation in that particular area. But you understand that. We don't understand which tree is meant for conservation. We're just <laughs> trying to make money see, from planting trees. What she's trees. telling you, when you plant a long tree, a tree in a wrong place, you will make losses. And you will 
affect the environment. You have heard, for example, there are some trees, they, 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 are, they are these, you have heard of the, the disease which attacked eucalyptus in the whole of this country, the bronze bug. People were calling it lice. It attacked eucalyptus in the whole west, east, central. Just because people have continuously planted what we call mono planting. You plant a single type of tree, you close rivers and lakes and you continue planting. And then these diseases, the hosts, the, 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 we, what we call the disease, the hosts, they, they, they eat also. So when they come to eat and there is a drought, there is no food, they even go to your homes and cause a lot of disaster. Earlier we spoke about um, the hindrances and you pointed out lawlessness as one of, one of the things. And so there's a question here, who are the main culprits? Are they large commercial interests? Are they small homesteads? Well, Josephine, before that, I wanted to go to, to, to pick up from what he's saying, that they're encouraging people. You know, we can't just put people in one basket. Uh, people, they are women, they are youth, and the men. I think you're aware that uh, the women largely do are not... affected. Yes, I do not, I do not own productive assets like land. So in, in the programs of forestry, we need to make deliberate efforts to target women and youth. Uh, recently, NFA advertised for planting. Uh, I think they, they need to give us feedback how many women and youth groups actually access the land for planting. Uh, women form a big part in agriculture and uh, the disappearance of, uh, disappearance of forests actually affect women, particularly on food security. Uh, we did a study and found out that women and children are actually forced to have few meals in Kalanga and Muvende and, and Masindi because of forest degradation. And um, even the children are forced to go to the casual labor because of forest degradation. Do, uh, do you perhaps to want earn. to give us the statistics on the women and, and, and the youth? The uh, at the moment, land. Uh, uh, let me quickly say that, uh, you know, after the 1995 constitution. You know, we're just looking at the recent allocation. Uh, just, very quickly, to that? Just, just very yeah. quickly also, because our time quickly runs I want very to quickly, say, so we yeah. have just a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So quickly if we I go way back, we will not get yeah. there. That increasingly, the policy of gender and equal opportunities has been focusing on women and children. And today, within NFA, the beneficiaries for the seedlings, it is 20 to 25% women. But when we go into the raising of the nursery, the chain, the, the value chain, 80% of them are actually women. And now about the land, the land You remember the results came out, the evaluation uh, results came out quickly. Everybody can go on the web and analyze that data. But what we are saying is that the policy and the government has increasingly indicated that you cannot sell land without the consent of a woman, that is in our constitution and the forestry policy, and the consent of children. Well, we have a lot of policies, and yeah. like you said, <coughs> lawlessness, we don't know who is, and lawlessness can go either way. It can be with the authorities, it can be with the I think the, the issue, Josephine, I'm trying to also, look at. I, I mm. want her to speak mm. because our time is quickly running, yeah, and if yeah, we stick to one thing, we're not really going to mm. get anywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to comment about what she said, that she wanted to know the percentage of ladies who, be, who benefited in this land evaluation. Yeah. Uh, we, we are very much aware that they benefited, and they were allocated land but the ratios were not, they were, they were not determined either by a certain, we didn't come up with some figure that this is meant for ladies, for ladies. but we are aware that there are ladies who also benefited from this land <coughs> so we allocation. Have no numbers or statistics to this, show. Yeah, the, the statistics is not with us right now. Yeah. Okay, well, let's but take another short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room, and we are talking Uganda's fast fading forests. Well, we've gone up and about for the last couple of minutes, and I want us to look at solutions 
what are we doing? And I'll, 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 I think the most obvious thing is the charcoal and um, the, the wood. And that takes us to a place of 98%. I think it's 98% of Ugandans yeah. use fuel wood energy. Yes. Mm. What are we doing to replace that so that we can at least take that off the table? Yeah, now the 98% is true, is a correct figure. So what we are doing, what we, we are encouraging communities to plant trees. On farm is also a solution to planting trees on, such that they can have their own fuel wood. And they shouldn't look at the forest as the only source. They can look at their own farm tree planting activity. And also, we, we are providing seedlings, like, we are, like my colleague has said, we are opening up avenues where, where more people can access seedlings and can plant, can have woodlots and can have firewood and can supply their needs regarding the forest products. So does that mean that our solution is tagged to plant more while you're cutting down on the other side? Do we not have any other solutions that are away from, can we not cut down the trees? Is there anything like that? Like you have said, we are now strengthening the partnerships at every level and trying to, <coughs> like for example, other than tra plant trees, we are in stronger collaboration with communities and the local governments. And indeed, we have started the initiatives for, for example, the beekeeping projects, which bring money. We have started the issues to do with the energy saving technologies, yeah, so that you reduce the quantity of firewood or charcoal that you use to cook. And so- By we using are what? The, these are energy saving technologies. For example, they are cook stoves. The energy yes. saving mm -hmm. stoves. Yes. Where you can have it and uh, reduce the quantity of wood that you use at your home. But also, we are encouraging people at household level to ensure that uh, they coordinate with all the other government initiatives. For example, we are indicating that uh, at, uh, for, for the, the ladies, the women, in collaboration we have the, the crafts. You know, forests are a source of all materials. So we are doing what we call value addition to the crafts and all the other forestry products. And what we need is now to network on the marketing so that people who produce these forestry products are able to get the right markets and improve their incomes. Okay, when, when I look at um, the statistics that you shared with me, and uh, I'm going to zero down to NFA, mm -hmm. you said <coughs> in 1990 there were 791,240 hectares. By 2015, there were 504,391. Yeah, that is true. How much more have we planted? Yeah. To date, we are looking at, we have, we have planted about 11,000 hectares. That is plantation. But of course, we look at, we are, we are, we needed to have an average of uh, uh, around 100,000 per hectare, I mean hectares on an annual basis to be able to meet the demands of the degradation. And how are we going about that? Yeah, as an institution, we are doing our part to plant, but also we are encouraging the communities to plant, like also the recent in intervention in the land allocation. We, we are aware that uh, the, the trees, the forest cover is going to increase. Okay, well, we had a few questions from, from the audience, and very quickly, if you could just hold the microphone and ask your question very quickly. Thank you. My name is Michael, and my question goes to Leo. What efforts uh, is the NFA putting in place to recover the, the massive loss of forest recovery. Leo? We are embarking on massive planting and supply of seedlings to communities, and we are happy that the government has supported us at all levels. Okay, and the next question? My name is Innocent Babaji. My question goes to Mr. Leo. What other sources of fuel have been put in place so that to save the existing forests? We, we have... Uh, the biomass, the biogas, by that is high technology. But that's why we are encouraging people to do what we call the energy saving stoves, so that you don't use a lot of firewood and you don't waste wood. 
probably maybe to supplement on it yes, right. solar energy would be also another alternative source of energy electricity would be another, another source of energy but that one is not affordable it's very within Uganda for the rural woman for the rural woman actually it's not uh, affordable really so that's why we are looking at fuel wood okay the next question uh, my name is Peters my question is I have seen that the, the government coming in to cut the trees that were planted along the, tr the, the streams. It happened when the water like started running short, out, short of the stream, like when the streams started running short of water. Where was the government by the time people were planting trees? Okay, the thing is, why doesn't the government promote awareness on which plants to, which trees to plant and where to plant them instead of it coming cutting the trees that people have tried to plant. Okay, who wants to take that question? Where was the government? Government is you and me. So you are equally responsible. Uh, I, I, what we would say is that uh, we, are, we, have we have started on the campaigns and we are involving the communities and we are sensitizing the communities and the people at large on where to plant the trees and how to plant and which species to plant. We are doing it. Probably it could have not, you, do, you couldn't have maybe come across it, but we are doing it. When you say government is, is you and me, and so for example, she sees this happening and she goes and says, stop. What, what, <coughs> what does an individual do? How does an individual you know, help the National she, Forestry Authority. She's also equally responsible in protecting these forests. Yes, but what does she do? Because if I went as an individual and said stop, I might get killed. What do I do? Who, do I report to somebody? Yeah. Do I, what do I do? She has to network with the uh, agencies that are, in, that are involved in the management of the resources. We need collaboration with the communities. We cannot do this work in isolation. That's why we need them. So in case they cite an, an activity taking place like that, please inform us inform the next nearby police, we work together and put the situation to order. Is there a hotline? Is there, how, how do we reach you? Because we're all not going uh, to like come you up have and said, I, we, we need to uh, start those new initiatives and have a clear direct line to NFA to report and action is taken. But like you have said, most of the culprits are some of the civil servants some of uh, our people are not professional and uh, some of our people are also very corrupt. And so at every level, let us fight corruption and be able to reach to the primary beneficiaries who are the rural people who live near these forests and also okay. try I to have... I think we've been blaming a lot of, of I think the communities and saying it is mm. the people surrounding the forest who are... And one of the questions that came up was who exactly are the biggest culprits? And that wasn't answered. <coughs> the biggest culprits are the people who are neighboring the communities. I mean, that are the communities that are neighboring the forests because they have the, the, the direct access to the resource. They sneak in, much as maybe there can be an influence from the outside, but they are the first people. Uh. You asked the issue of the hotline. We've been having a partnership with the National Forest Authority and the Anti-Corruption <coughs> Coalition. So we have a toll-free line, and uh, we also have an uh, SMS platform. What's the toll-free line? Um, I don't have it off head, but the SMS platform, you can use 6006 um, or 8500. We are trying to link it to the U report. And it's been a su successful project uh, where communities have been reporting, and N we, we collaborate with NFA report on time, and uh, they respond on time. Mm -hmm. So That's we've true. been able to reduce some illegalities. Mm. I also wanted to add that uh, we need to look at this from a broader perspective and as civil society we are promoting climate smart agriculture where people can increase their production on land without encroaching on forest reserves uh, for clearing them for agriculture. That's one innovation and then we've also been working with groups on seeing how they add value to agriculture or if they negotiate with NFA and access land or resources, uh, how else can they productively use that? So we've been doing that and we continue to do that in, even in the coming years, as long as we get some funding. Okay. Yeah. Your question? My name is Nasuru Wens Mestigwa. My question goes to Ben. As the person, what have we done to control 
destruction of forest since you know it is done by biggest people in management I, I, I think was that for Leo yeah, for yeah Leo they're targeting you what have you done <laughs> as an individual since you know this is happening I, I, at the I, top I, I must say that uh, I have uh, those who have uh, been following I've done my part but it's not me as Leo it should be well clearly he hasn't been following as, so as an he institution wants to know. as an institution mm. we, we have uh, strengthened our <laughs> law enforcement for the protection and the legal prosecution of the culprits but also we are working internally to ensure that our staff really become very disciplined like I said corruption is uh, killing our country and so uh, everybody at every level there is nobody who is above the law and I'm inviting everybody to really punish even those we can't of our punish staff. Leo. We, we can't punish we don't have let the me power. tell you the law nobody is above the law yeah but we can't punish as individuals yeah. you're saying you want you us can to help in reporting that we can report yeah okay okay yeah, you can report and action can be taken it is unfortunate that our, that our forests continue to disappear it is very bad but i think everybody starting from the most powerful should take their responsibility and change it's these It's a things. collective responsibility, really. the, the management is... <coughs> I, th I think also we need to step up the, the issue of collaborative forest management. Uh, mm -hmm. The government has a good policy on having communities collaborate with central government uh, agencies, uh, NFA in particular, uh, to increase their participation. And uh, I saw that in Tanzania, it's working very well, where they have women groups and youth groups negotiating and reaching to an agreement on how they can manage this forest well. So it will not be a blame game that uh, you are the, the communities are the one degrading. And if the roles are spelled out very clearly, it can work. It's working well in other countries. Then in Tanzania, again, they have an, a, a program or their law provides for incentivizing communities who are participating in community policing. Like if they report these crimes and whatever. So maybe we need to step up also our policies here and see how we can incentivize whistleblowers and then also pay the communities who are participating like the patrolmen pay them on time that will help is that a possibility is that something that's happening yeah it is it is, <coughs> it is we have uh, also collaborative forest management in here in uganda which is taking place with these neighboring communities and but also the idea of payment for the ecosystem services the person who is protecting this forest must be able to see a benefit. Are they seeing the benefits now? The, the, yeah, of course the benefits may not be immediate, but of course they are, they are long-term benefits. But in the process of negotiation, we clearly spell out the, the benefits, how they, should be, they will benefit from pro by protecting the forest. What's the picture now of our forests? How badly or how well are we doing as we wind up? Maybe we don't fully understand us who are just on the outside. How, how badly or how well are we doing with our forest yeah, cover? In terms of uh, the plantation development strategy, plantation development it is, it is increasing demand for tree planting. So the image for tree planting is very promising. On the other hand, the rate of conversion of natural forests to other land uses is still increasing. And that is the gap that we need to really fix. So we have, for example, refugees, we have a bigger population now, we are producing more, and I think one of the recommendations that I oh, saw yeah. is that we should uh, work on our population should, control, but exactly. how are we going to do that? By sensitizing the communities, really, because now the, most, the more people that are produced, the more pressure on the forest resource. So we need the government to get together as, as a collective entity we need to sensitize up our population on, on controlling the population, on whatever, on having well, family planning. Let me tell you people, the number of people is not the problem. The problem is our behavior. 
if we don't respect the law, things cannot remain the same. We need funding to conserve our nature. But even when funding comes and you are not disciplined, things cannot improve. So increasingly, we need to invest in respect of the rule of law. When the people respect the law, all things will be okay. Yes. Uh, I wanted to pick up from the, the point of the refugees. Indeed, they are putting a lot of pressure. We were in, in Arua recently, and uh, when we calculated from June to December, the rate of clearance for the wood, for the fuel wood and, 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 the, ten, and, and the, the shelter, it was equivalent to clearance of around 3,000 hectares in, three, in six months. So we really need to invest in, in tree planting, but also now begin to work with the refugees on development aspects and them even to get involved in environmental conservation. We Agencies have been working on protection and ensuring that they have shelter and this and this. But now we need to start raising awareness for the, to the refugees, the host communities, let them also get involved in environment protection and also they, let them understand the environment laws and, and, and regulations in the country such that they are part of the solution, not part of the problem. All right. Well, we have yeah. about a minute left, so if you'd all like to just sum up your one thought, something that you'd like the public to know in just one sentence, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, would you like to start, Renee? Yes. Uh, what I want to say at this particular moment, in order to save the forests of this country, the policy makers and the communities have to change their attitude towards the natural resource management. Okay. Yeah. Leo? Let's all work together, strengthen the partnerships, and respect the law, protect these forests, and uh, they will give us what we want. We will become richer when the environment is stable. We all want to plant one tree, eucalyptus and pine, and hope to make money. Yeah, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, l let's get the Minister of Finance to invest more in uh, agriculture to, de to respect the Maputo Declaration of having a 10% investment and then let the Ministry of Finance also increase the budget allocation for the National Forest Authority. All right. Yep. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for taking the time to speak with us on the show. Uh, coming up is NTV Weekend Edition. Keep it NTV. Renew your monthly basic bouquet subscription of 18,000 shillings before it expires. Then enjoy three free days only on Star Times. Enjoy digital life.